Well, good morning, my beloved church, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I wish I could see your smiling faces, but some kind soul has painted your faces all over the chairs. They, they printed out your pictures, so I feel like I'm preaching to you all. I'll be looking at your faces while I'm preaching. Thank you for whoever did that. I believe it was Kim. Well, this is a special Lord's Day for us at Southside as the first Sunday of every month we partake of the Lord's table together, and that is always my highlight of the month, and that's our goal this morning. So if you uh, have available a way to get some juice or a cracker or something to partake with us at the end, uh, I would love to have you join us. So granted that the Lord's table is an ordinance that has been given to the church of God to partake together in unity and then to remember the death of our Savior. And so my heart is missing the local assembly so badly. Uh, at that graveside service Wednesday, just to see some of the saints who were there, it was such an encouragement, and I wanted to hug them with all my heart, and it's just so tough. Zoom doesn't do it for me. <laughs> so while we cannot be at the building together this morning, we're, we are together as one during this worship service, and we're just singing out our hearts to God, and we're going to hear the same message on the grace of God, and then we will, with one heart and one faith, we're going to remember together the sacrificial death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray that it would unite us even more while we are apart and that we would sense even uh, deeper our, our unity uh, that we have in Christ at the table this morning. So let's pray uh, for, for God to encourage our hearts and our, our country and wherever you may join us this morning. And so let's go before him and and pray. Father, I, I pray now that you would come and minister mightily to us as we gather together to look at an amazing portion of Scripture and then to remember our sweet Christ. God, I pray now that you will go to every heart and soul listening, Lord, and that your words would pierce and penetrate. For those that just need encouragement, I pray, encourage for those who might need peace for the first time, oh God, I pray that you would give them peace with the living God, even in this hour. And so God, do what only you can do. There are a million needs and, and you're able to meet every one of them. And so I pray, would you do that this morning during this hour? Amen. If you'll turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 9 is where we're going to be looking this is such a beautiful passage that we're going to look at. And so what I want to do first before we begin is I just want to give you a brief context uh, so that we'll be able to understand this chapter that we will look at this morning. Abraham, early on in Genesis, he's called out by God to, to now be a follower of God. And then comes Isaac and Jacob, and they're, they're now the nation of Israel. And they've been prosperous in the passing of time. Uh, God has been with them. But now they, they find themselves uh, in slavery in Egypt after Joseph died. And then they're, they're delivered with Moses as their leader. And they have these 10 plagues upon the Egyptian leader. And the whole country is, is uh, the whole nation of Israel is set free. And when they're going, the Egyptians are chasing them. And you have the parting of the Red Sea and the drowning of the whole Egyptian army. And time passes. And then we come to the book of Judges. And the enemies are surrounding Israel, the Philistines, and all these different tribes against them. And Israel comes now after that season with their judges leading them. And they say, we want a king. We want one like all the other nations surrounding us to be our ruler. And so the people pick Saul, who is a head, a head and shoulders above anyone else in the whole nation. He's a mighty warrior and valiant. But Saul lacked something very important like a true heart after God. And his kingship was marked by sin and disobedience. And so the kingdom is eventually taken from Saul. And God has picked his king for the nation of Israel. And it was a shepherd boy whose father was Jesse. And he was the youngest among the sons. And the scriptures tell us he was handsome and ruddy. But most importantly, it was said of God and by God himself that he was a man after God's own heart. 
And as David was being elevated and finding military victories and spiritual victories throughout the the history of Israel, they would sing about him and say, Saul has slain his thousands, but David has tens tens of thousands. And Saul became jealous that David was going to take over his kingdom. And the hand of God was just all over David. And Saul had a jealousy and 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 a hatred that now came toward David. And he began to seek his death. And much of 1 Samuel will give you the details of a very intriguing storyline. But eventually Saul's reign then comes to an end. And there was a battle. And and he's killed and three of his sons were killed in that battle. And then eventually his fourth son would be killed as well. And his whole line is going to be wiped out. The beginning of the book, 2 Samuel. We have a divided kingdom now when Saul dies. And it's Saul's son and David are are both ruling different parts of Israel. David's ruling Judah and his son's ruling different areas of Israel. But now David is the winner and the the kingdom is unified and established. In chapter 5 of this 2 Samuel, David is now anointed king. In chapter 6, he comes into Jerusalem and he makes it his capital. Then in chapter 7, the great prophet Nathan comes and says to David, you're going to have a permanent kingship. Someone will sit on your throne forever, and there's going to be a king who's going to sit on that throne, and his kingdom will have no end. Where we read at the beginning in Matthew 21, Jesus Christ is going to be that greater David who's going to come, and his kingdom will never end. In chapter 8, he conquers all of his enemies in battle. And now in chapter 9, we come to this amazing story. And and we will look at it. When David comes, now look with me in verse 1. David said, chapter 9, Is there yet anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? David wants to show the kindness of God to any of Saul's descendants, which is really amazing. Because Saul was his greatest enemy Up to that point, Saul wanted to kill him with all of his passions. And now, how can I show any kindness to anyone from Saul's family? It's just an amazing setting. And there's just so much here to teach us this morning. And so I pray that your hearts will be as blessed as mine in my study this week. My heart has been overwhelmed in the beauty of this passage. So let me give you your outline that we will follow this morning. I want to consider four aspects of what the story of 2 Samuel 9 teaches us. And the first thing we're going to see is the king's heart. And then we're going to look at the recipient of the king's heart named Mephibosheth. And then we'll see all the blessings of the king's heart that will be poured upon this man. And then we're going to close out with some amazing application. So in verse 1, David, is there anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness Uh, for Jonathan's sake. So it appears that David here remembers something. And he made a covenant with Jonathan, his best friend, who was Saul's son. And that he would provide and protect for the house of Saul forever. My family is your family. Your family is mine. David is a man of his word. Saul's house has been decimated And David is wondering now, is there anyone left in that dynasty that I can show kindness to? We see that in verse 1. Look at verse 3. The king said, is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? In verse 7, David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show kindness to you, Mephibosheth, for the sake of your father, Jonathan. So in verse 3, I just want to show the kindness of God. And you all know how much I I love this Hebrew word here for kindness. I I have a t-shirt that says hesed. And that Hebrew word is one of the greatest ones, I think, in the whole Bible. And it means God's kindness, his steadfast love, his covenantal love. It's that God loves us now unconditionally and how we perform and how we do. His love doesn't go away. It just is steadfast and it keeps coming after us and pouring bounty and blessing upon us. And that's the word David says, I just want to show hesedness to anyone from the house of Saul. If I had to show you the opposite of this word, I would say it's a day in America. 
I, I was listening to a, gr- a great teacher this week describe it this way. He said, we have consumer relationships. And he says it works really well in business in this sense. You meet my needs and we'll use your product and we will use your services. And if you don't, we're out and and we're not going to work together and we'll go find someone cheaper or better. And that is, is what makes people strive for the best product and service. And there's really some good benefit to a structure like that in business. (laughs) <laughs> but where the problem arises is when we treat each other that way in our relationships and our friendships and our families and our churches and in our neighborhoods. If you don't meet my needs, who needs you? We, we have little tabs that we can hit to unfollow anyone that says or does something we don't like. And, and I just see it constantly. I, I unfriend anyone who's toxic Consumer relationships are just disposable, and that's what defines our nation this morning. Our needs are more important than our relationships, and it's destroying our culture, and sadly enough, it's destroying our friendships and our churches and our marriages. It's so broken that there's just so many lonely people before quarantine. And because the covenant love that we're going to look at this morning is just not how we do relationships. And so covenantal love is somewhat foreign to our culture, where you serve and you sacrifice for one another, even when they're not meeting your needs. It's, it's the cry of our land. It's what every heart is longing for because you're made in the image of God. It's missing. And at a time like this, it's what we know we need. We feel alone and isolated And what we have here at Southside Bible Church is a community that cares and helps. And despite my weaknesses and my defects, they they love me and they bring meals, they pray. They're drawing near together like never before because it's all based on hessedness that God has given to us. So when this quarantine is lifted, I pray that it's awakened the world to its need for true community a place where covenantal love is believed upon with God and it's lived out among each other, a place where people love you and help you when you're in need and bring meals to your house in a pandemic and go to your graveside and weep with those who weep, who are not consumers but committers to one another, who sit at your table in covenantal love. This is what the world is crying for more than ever, And they're seeing it and they're tasting it and we have it. And this is time more than ever now. We bring them in to this love that we have in Christ and in our community. And and, and they're going to see the love of God by the love that we have for one another. And so I want every one of you to get ready to bring people into it the second they lift this band. That was for free. (laughs) Keep moving. Back to our passage. Sorry, I could not resist that. David, no need to keep this promise made to Jonathan. He's dead. Things took a turn after they made the promise. They died, and the family of Saul is now a threat to David's throne. Forget the promise. But that's not the heart of the man after God's own heart. That is not the heart of God as we will see in our passage. So in verse 1, the heart of the king Is there anyone that I can show kindness to from the house of Saul? Second point then. That's the heart of our king. Now I want to see who's going to be the recipient of the king's heart. And I want you to look with me in verse 2. Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And they called him to David. And the king said to him, are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who's crippled in both feet. So there's only one soul left from the house of Saul. It's the son of Jonathan, the one who David made a covenant with, the one that he loved so dearly. And the only one left It's his son who's crippled in both feet. And in verse 6, his name is Mephibosheth. I just want to give you a little history on this man. 
Up until the age of five, he just had a charmed life. He was a prince and maybe a future king. But one day the Philistines came in and defeated his grandfather Saul and his father and his uncles died that day. And the whole dynasty of his family crashed. And the Philistines were coming to take their plunder and ravage the house of Saul and the whole city. And in 2 Samuel 4, a nurse grabs that boy, Mephibosheth, at age five, and she's running off to try to save his life. And she accidentally drops him. And his legs are injured, and now he's been crippled for life since age five. And I just want you to imagine how hard this must have been for this young lad. He lost his father and grandfather in one battle. He lost all of his wealth. He lost his position, his health. This man has lost it all in one day, and he has nothing. And he's living in exile for fear of his life in Lodabar, and that maybe the king is going to come now and destroy and kill him. So this is a man who is helpless and pitiful. And so at this time, Mephibosheth must be feeling, I'm safe. They're never going to find me now where I'm hidden away across the river. And then all of a sudden, one day, a servant of the king shows up and tells him, King David wants to see you. You're being brought to the the palace. Can you imagine the fear that must have come over this man? Look at verse 6. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he said, here is your servant. David said to him, do not fear. (laughs) Why? Because this young man is trembling. He is most certain that this is his day of execution. For the custom of the day was when a new ruler or king took over a new household. They would go and they would kill all the other descendants of the old household so no rival could begin or grow up and, 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 and cause trouble or, or you know, try to defeat them during that reign. And they would purge the old dynasty. In 1 Kings 15, they did it with King Basha. 1 Kings 16 with King Zimri. And in 2 Kings 10, they did it with Jehu. This was a very common practice of the day. And there's a civil war that went on for many years after Saul. And so the only way David could be safe as a king was to hunt down every descendant of Saul and kill him. And so they were, they, were, they were a real danger to David. And so it would seem for certain that in Mephibosheth's mind, he's been caught and it's time to be executed. And he's very afraid, for he, sh- he should die. And he has nothing to merit any action by David that would be contrary I have nothing to take away the king's wrath. I have no arguments. I have no money. I have nothing to stop this. And I want you to get that. I want that to settle in your heart this morning. Because what David does is extravagant love. It's hesed. It's countercultural to anything in our day. And I just want you to look with me at what David does at our third point. We will now see, we see the king's heart We see the recipient of his heart. And now I want to look at the blessings that that flow out of the king's heart with me in verse 7. David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father Jonathan and will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul and you shall eat at my table regularly. And again, he prostrated himself and said, what is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? And then the king called Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, all that belonged to Saul and all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him and you shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless, Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. And now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so your servant will do. 
And so Mephibosheth ate at the king's, at David's table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. And so Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem and he ate at the king's table regularly. And now he was lame in both feet. Do not fear. The words we looked at last week in Isaiah 41.10 at a time like this, do not fear for I'm your God. The words the sweet Christ would say so often to his disciples, do not fear. The word the resurrected Christ said to the apostle John when he saw him in his resurrected glory, he said, do not fear. The best words that could ever come from a king who should kill you with all authority and power do not fear. And listen to all that the king says he will do for this crippled man who was an enemy. Guys, this is unexpected. It's undeserved. And it just makes it all the sweeter. Does it not? I will show kindness to you. I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul, who was a king and owned a lot of land. And you shall eat at my table regularly. Ziba, with his 15 sons and 20 servants, will cultivate the land for you and bring in the produce. And in verse 11, you're going to be as one of the king's sons. Where does this come from? Mephibosheth must be blown away at this point. What? I'm afraid that you're going to kill me. I was praying for a miracle. I was praying that you would let me live and send me back to my hole. What is this? How does he feel with such hessedness being lavished upon him by the king? Verse 8. He prostrates himself and says, What is your servant? that you should regard a dead dog like me. I'm unworthy. I don't deserve this. Why would you do this to a dead dog? This is amazing grace that is being shown to this man. And the answer from David, I don't want you to miss this. It's so simple. If you look in verse one, I want to show him kindness. What does he say? For Jonathan's sake, come to verse seven. Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan. What, what is all this? And I, just, I think a little backstory is necessary, and I'm going to give it to you. God sends the prophet Samuel to anoint David to be the next king after Saul. And as I said, Saul's furious. He had a son who would be the next king, and his name is Jonathan. And so Saul wants to kill David so that it continues to be Jonathan's and in his descendants, the king, kingdom. So what would you expect? I would expect Jonathan wants to kill David. He's next in line. He just lost the throne. But his response is just the opposite. Jonathan and David become best friends with hessedness and this mutual love and covenant in relationship. And Jonathan, he could see the Lord's anointing upon David. And he loved David deeply, the scriptures tell us. In 1 Samuel 18 through 20, you see this covenant of friendship that the two of them made. And Jonathan swears to love David and be loyal to him all of his days. And he promises to protect David from his own father, Saul, because he knows it's wickedness that his father's doing. And that David is a man after God's own heart. So he defends his own friend over his own father. And he takes off his robe and his sword, which meant he's giving up his throne to David. And as the story progresses, Jonathan did save David's life from his father. And Jonathan died in that last battle on Mount Geboa. <clears throat> so what all this means is that David had a deep friend who loved him covenantally. And he put himself in harm's way to get David out of harm's way. 
And so it's amazing that Jonathan lost his throne so that David could ascend it. And you just don't see stuff like that anywhere. It's Hesed. It's this covenantal love that the two of them had. And so David never forgot that covenantal love between him and Jonathan. And now after all these battles, David, it slows down and he says, I, I want to show love to any descendant of Jonathan and it's Mephibosheth. And so he pours out this unconditional love upon Mephibosheth because of the great love that his father had shown to him. Because of Jonathan, David would show kindness to him, restore the land, and bring him into his home as one of his own sons. And he's always going to be at his table and he will receive all the benefits of adoption of being brought into the king's family. Don't miss this. Mephibosheth did not deserve any of this. I'm a dead dog. It was Jonathan's love and work imputed to Mephibosheth that he was receiving all these blessings. It is what Jonathan had done and not what you have done, Mephibosheth. <laughs> that brought him into the king's presence and his table as a son. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me and Mephibosheth. One of the sweetest stories in the Bible of just this hessedness of, of God's love being poured out upon another human being. So why does pastor pick a passage like this uh, for communion? And that's why I want to show you now our fourth point in this amazing application. We can't miss this. God is painting a picture for us in this passage of the redemptive story of God. And Jesus said, all the law and the prophets point to me. And so this passage points to Christ. And Jesus is all over this passage. There's a greater David who would come into this world and his kingdom will have no end. And he came to show hessedness to the nations. The salvation of our souls to come sit at the true king's table. And so I want you to consider a few thoughts. First, in our story, it's the king that takes an initiative. Mephibosheth is hiding. <laughs> He's fearing for his life, and he would have died in a rat's hole if the king didn't pursue him. But the king sought him out and brought him to himself so he could pour out the love of God upon him. The condescension and the great love of our king as he seeks us out. In Romans 3, it says there are none who seek for God. In Romans 5, while you were yet enemies, Christ died for us. The whole gospel, as we see in Romans, we're studying right now in Romans 3, 21, we're all sinners. We're like Mephibosheths. We're lame. We can't seek God. We can't change our, ourselves. We can't change our nature. We can't change our standing with God. And it says, but now... God came and he did something to rescue us. That is the whole gospel. In Ephesians, you were dead in your sins, but God being rich in mercy has raised you up. So I want you to see that this God seeks people out to bring and show his covenantal blessings upon you. And so I pray that he's, he's drawing you. In John 6, he says, no one can come to the Father, Jesus said, unless the Father who sent me draws him to himself. And I pray that there's something going on in your heart that you're even tuning into this and that you're beginning to think about life and death and eternity. And, and the King is seeking you out, even this morning, to pour out abundant blessings upon your head. I pray that. There's a hymn that says, It is not that I did choose thee, for Lord, it could not be. This heart would still refuse thee, hadst thou not chosen me. I pray the king is seeking you this morning. I pray he's going after you. Secondly, I want to come now before the king. How could you ever stand 
before the king. If you were asked that question this morning, how could you stand before the king, what would you say? I deserve loving kindness. I'm a good guy. I'm better than Jimmy down the road. I'm just nice. I deserve it. That answer is going to affect your whole eternity. And the majority of today believe that they're just good guys. And they believe they've merited something and that good people go to heaven and they can stand before the king. It's the opposite of the whole Bible. They're trembling. This, this Mephibosheth is trembling and silenced with shame. I deserve execution. I'm a dead dog. I have nothing to commend myself to the king. Even my righteousness in Isaiah is a filthy rag before God. When you see how holy he is and all your goodness, you're going to be holding a filthy rag when you see how blazingly holy God is. Execution is my only hope. And we can run and hide and pray that God doesn't find me. Some of you have been running for decades and this little virus is bringing you out. And all the things you've been running to aren't working, they're broken. And now you're coming and, and I need help. I need help. And this morning the king says, come before me. Come before me. Blind, naked, unclothed, none of your own righteousness. And just come before me with nothing. And then my third point is how can the king then give me grace and mercy if I can't merit, I can't get his favor? How, how do I get it? And as we saw in our passage this morning, by the imputation of Jonathan, by what Jonathan had done, was the reason David would show this lame dog favor and grace. A great friend. And I want to tell you this morning, we have even a greater friend than Jonathan. What a friend we have in Jesus. A friend who sticks closer than a brother. And I want to tell you this, for his sake, God can love you this morning. That's good news that it's not your merit and your righteousness. For his sake, God can love you. And he can show you kindness and he can forgive all of your sins and separate them as far as the east is from the west. And he says, I remember your sins no more. He can bring you into his presence so that you can sit at his table and have fellowship with him. And he'll adopt you into his family as a son or daughter. And we are the children of God because of this greater friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. God can impute all that he has done to us. And he came into this world and God imputed all of our sins upon his own son. And on a cross, he poured out his full wrath upon his own son so that he could show you mercy and forgive you and pour out the grace that we're looking at this morning. And Jesus came and he lived a perfect life. He loved God with his heart, mind, soul, and strength and his neighbor as himself 24-7. He came and he showed us what perfect righteousness is. He fulfilled the law's demands so that now God could treat you as if you fulfilled God's demands and can now be blessed abundantly and be drawn into a love relationship and receive blessing upon blessing. God can treat you because of the greater friend we have in Jesus. I'm telling you, David's friend Jonathan lost an earthly throne but our friend left a heavenly throne and came to this earth to save sinners among who I am foremost. David had a friend who died on Mount Gil Gilboa for him. And we have a friend who died on Mount Calvary for us hanging on a cross in our place. Jonathan shielded his father from David. And so Christ shields us from his father on Calvary. Jesus says, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. And there's no greater love than this. Then one lays down his life for his friends. Therefore, love one another. The love shown to us because of our friend, Christ. God loves us because of his actions. And he can pour out abundant grace upon Mephibosheths like ourselves. So sweet. 
And I want to look fourthly then at the Hesedness. Mephibosheth was a prince. And he lost all of it on the judgment of his grandfather. His grandfather's actions of sin took him down. The whole dynasty. And so Adam, the father of many nations, was, was created and brought into this world. Our father was a king. God said, you can have dominion over all the creation. And he sinned like Saul. And his whole household died, which is every human being has now been separated from God because of our, our descendant, Adam. And this death is still upon mankind as we see in this virus. We're all marked for death. And we are hiding from the king, lame and impotent to do anything to earn his favor. We deserve the wrath of God from the king like Mephibosheth did. But we get just the opposite like he did. We get the hessedness, the kindness, the loving faithfulness of God because of Christ. We get to be rulers and princes over land with a new heaven and a new earth because of our King, Jesus Christ. We're going to get tenfold more than Mephibosheth ever got. And the best thing that we get three times in this passage, I think they, they want us to figure this out. You're going to sit at my table. You're going to sit at the king's table. You're going to be at my table. God brings you now into fellowship. And he adopts you as a child of the king. And I can sit now and have fellowship with God. I have peace with God now through our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm reconciled. I'm one. Adam, I can walk in the garden with God now again. I don't need to fear anything do not fear, because I now can sup with the king, and I'm a child. I'm a child of God. The grace of God poured out upon us because of our friend Jesus Christ. All this poured out on a dead dog, undeserving and unmerited. All to Jesus, I surrender. This is what this virus is all about. To wake you up to your real need. To take away many of our false hopes and securities because they're not standing up and they're not holding us up. What are we going to do when we stand before the king who has all power and all authority? And I want to offer to you the only hope and remedy, the purpose for all of history is the King God wants to show us hessedness, covenantal love because of the work of His own Son who came to this world and lived the life we should have and died the death that we deserved. And in our text, Mephibosheth could have said, you know what, I, I, I don't believe there's a king. I don't even believe that there's a king. Or he could have said, you know what, this, this is just too good to be true. I don't buy it, David. <laughs> no one could be this nice. I believe there are many ways to the king. There's a lot of different ways that I could get into your table. I'm not a lame dog. <laughs> I'm better than, I, I want to merit this. I, 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 I don't need your handouts. I can work. I'm, I've got goodness. I'm going to get my way to the king. All of that is trash. There's only one way to the king. To receive the free gift of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. All you can come is as a Mephibosheth with nothing and hold out an empty hand and receive the abundant, bountiful blessings that God freely bestows upon unworthy people because of the worthy one, the Son of God. Grace, it's the freeness of the love that God wants to offer to the one who will quit working and striving to get this favor. I pray that. I pray that.